yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I, I find it interesting with uh, mentioning the YouTube videos because the YouTube videos, he's giving credit to BJSM and even to me. It actually began with a friendship, and the friendship was with somebody you used to know here at Karim Khan, and it was just that friendship that really developed those videos. So it's uh, creating these relationships that probably uh, makes the biggest deal in terms of our careers. I'm going to uh, share with you a few thoughts on uh, the developmental history of special, uh, with a special focus on pain, brain, and bane. And Scott teased me here a second ago as he made everybody think about, about this uh, in just in terms of what the title meant because I was having fun with the rhyme, but uh, the bane of our existence is can cancer. So we're going to talk about how exercise has a potential of uh, uh, helping us regarding some cancer issues. So I received no corporate funding for any aspect of this talk. Another issue I should share with you is that you sit there and go, why is an orthopedic surgeon, uh, visiting surgeon, talking to you about this? And part of that is my roles with American College of Sports Medicine, where I serve as the treasurer for the foundation. I serve as the chairman of the Medical Education Committee and have served on the board as well as a past vice president. And uh, EIM is really a kind of a baby of, uh, ACSM, of ACSM for many years and has been uh, really kind of uh, expanded globally. So my goal here is to ultimately share with you some thoughts, not on the classic aspects of exercise as medicine where we target uh, diabetes, obesity, and those things, but some of these other topics. So greetings from where I'm from, which is Chicago, Illinois, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, and for those of you who just need our uh, brief review, exercise as medicine, the original goal of exercise as medicine was to make physical activity assessment and exercise prescription a standard part of the disease prevention and treatment paradigm for all patients. The United States global launch occurred in November of 2007, and the global launch was in May of 2008. So before we get really started and, and to get a little basis of the group here, is are you currently practicing? And I, I know that Qatar in 2014 began instituting EIM, and this is one of the key focuses of EIM. But my question for you in the audience is clinically, are you practicing EIM? So, are you currently using exercise as a vital sign on every visit? So not, not bad. Uh, we get maybe 30% of the crowd here. Uh, is it built into your electronic medical record? Okay, Because there's only a few different, uh, in the United States, there's still only a few different uh, uh, institutions that have it built in that require as a normal vital sign is what, uh, how, ma how many minutes of exercise did you have per week? and then that it allows an encouragement and a prescription of the doctor to say you should be doing more. Um, and do you routinely engage and have formalized institutional EIM referral? I know that you have that here. Uh, and do you routinely discuss home exercise programs? So those, that, those of us that don't have that, pretty much routinely, uh, my plan is I'll have handouts for uh, 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 exercise program. Now, we just said it was 2007, but is exercise as medicine, was it really a new discovery or, or, or what's going on? And the answer is no, not really a new discovery. We know, we know back in ancient times that uh, uh, China talked about medical gymnastics. In India, they had exercise prescription every day at 50% uh, effort uh, and it was treated for various a uh, aspects, particularly senility, which is going to be important as I talk about some issues regarding brain. Uh, uh, it goes through one of the famous uh, uh, doctors in time, Galen, who prescribed for arthritis and depression and gout and epilepsy and vertigo, uh, su suggested exercise as a treatment. Again, topics that we'll talk about a little bit today. And then it brings us to modern times all the way up to 2014 uh, as Qatar has uh, included exercise as medicine. So uh, contributors to overall health status, the, uh, just kind of a brief review for uh, just kind of catch us up over the next few minutes about uh, some of the impact of exercise as medicine, uh, uh, some of the key contributors for uh, overall health status, the power of health behaviors. We talk about genetics, environment, access to medical care and health behaviors, but of the, by, by far the strongest issue, 50% of the impact for health care is actually health behaviors. And, and of those, uh, the, the 50%, they're mostly modifiable issues. These include things like exercise, smoking, and diet, which can have a significant impact then on, on general health. So which, with, with that said, what factors of all the different healthcare issues that we take care of are the biggest factors that are gonna uh, uh, relate to death? So you're right. So is it obesity? Not in and of itself. Is it smoking? Is it hypertension? Is it high cholesterol? Is it diabetes? Actually, if you factor in fitness to that, that list, the biggest factor is poor fitness. And so we have to look at that. And in fact, 
More specifically, impact on exercise with chronic disease mortality within those groups of, in terms of hypertension, COPD, diabetes, smoking, and BMI. If you look in terms of the exercise activity, so if you can actually exercise more than eight uh, METs of uh, exercise compared to five, you can see the, the significant drop in each of the categories with exercise in terms of your relative risk of death. So significant impact that exercise is going to have virtually on every one of your patients uh, 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 that have any general health disease. How about the impact of exercise on age-related mortality? Just the fact, unfortunately, as we all get older, death is somewhere in the, in, in, in the future for us. But in fact, can we potentially postpone that with exercise? And the answer is virtually at every age group available. So 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and over 80, actually a fit person who is actively exercising has a significantly less risk of death. And so staying physically active is going to be very important. So certainly uh, for uh, everybody that knows about exercise as medicine, very the kind of the, it, certainly we know that it works. Physical activity, you can do, you can do it with walking, jogging, hiking, uh, basketball, soccer. You can do any types of exercise as long as you actually increase your heart rate and become physically uh, active. You want to do about uh, an optimum of about 150 minutes per week. So you're in adults and you're, so you basically tell your patients about 30 minutes a day. 60 minutes a day for, for, for kids, and you try to get them away from the television and actually do more physical activities. It's actually good for, uh, for, for babies and for their health also in terms of uh, during pregnancy and lactation. So how does it, how does it work when you're going to actually suggest it? Uh, well, the bottom line is, is it's also true that more is not better. If you overtrain and have over, overloading, there is a potential risk of, uh, of getting injuries. And so the biggest impact by far actually occurs just getting started. So you ramp up in terms of uh, the weekly exercise, and the, uh, the benefit is significant. At some point, over moderate levels of activities, then you may increase your risk. But just getting started, doing even 30 minutes a day, is going to make a big difference. So in terms of, uh, what, in terms of its general indications, and we'll talk about the specific uh, different categories that, we, that, we're, that we're here to kind of share with you, uh, but it can affect all kinds of different things. It certainly targets obesity. It targets uh, diabetes, targets uh, hypertension, heart, targets uh, uh, heart disease. All of these things I think we know and are pretty, pretty well recognized. But the surprising ones for me actually is not those things because the diabetes, uh, the obesity, diabetes, all of those things I think are pretty well proven is does it really have an effect on fractures, osteoarthritis, uh, uh, cancer, and a variety of brain problems uh, uh, things like psychologic problems, depression, and actually significant brain diseases. Uh, and those, I think that surprises me as much as anything else in terms of the potential impact for that. So if I'm going to give you one reference, uh, uh, this is a phenomenal reference. I'll leave it up for just a second, but it's, uh, uh, and you'll get a copy, I think, of this, uh, this talk as much as you want it. And this was an impressive article uh, from Scandinavia in 2015 that uh, looked at exercise as medicine and looked at a variety of uh, 26 different chronic diseases. And basically, they walked through all of the different chronic diseases and figured out which of those exercises medicine had significant impact on. Uh, and some of those are going to include things uh, dealing with the brain and, and pain issues, as well as cancer. So as I walk through those different uh, uh, thoughts for you, the, my challenge for you is to look at each of, the, each of these different topics and say, does exercises medicine really work? Now, we're all, we're all, we all should be reading the literature. We all should be thinking about uh, good science. And to do that, I would suggest that we uh, try to evaluate this as the what's the best quality? Is this just somebody from somewhere that said, hey, it worked for me? Or is it actually really reasonable evidence that's actually supporting some of the conclusions that we're going to talk about in terms of each of these different uh, disease patterns? And uh, so uh, certainly we know this, this triangle that basically says just expert opinion all the way up to systematic reviews, uh, randomized control tiles. Uh, the, the better quality of evidence are going to support this, the better. So I'm going to categorize that as you walk, through, uh, you walk through the rest of these talks, is if you see it labeled in green, that means it's a really good, strong support. And if it's red, it's probably a little bit less, red or orange. Yellow is somewhat in the mid, mi, uh, middle in terms of its quality. So uh, we're going to talk about bone and joint health, chronic pain, some neuro, uh, neuropsychologic issues, as well as cancer. So example. Osteoporosis. Does exercise and medicine have any significant effect on osteoporosis? 68-year-old woman with a history of lumbar compression uh, fracture as well as a distal radius fracture. Is exercise and medicine uh, something that's really important for her? Well, what we know is that osteoporosis has a variety of risk factors, including alcohol, 
corticosteroid use, calcium, estrogen, smoking, and sedentary lifestyle. And so certainly not having a sedentary lifestyle and being active is going to address one of these factors that increases your risk of osteoporosis. Well, how about, what about the cost of treatment? If we looked at cost of treatment that everybody else is using for or more classic uh, uh, non-exercise medicine treatments are for osteoporosis, they're very expensive. Uh, so uh, uh, Fosfamax is up to uh, 1225 American dollars per year. Uh, uh, Forteo, $12,000 per year, compared to a home exercise program that if we can actually show that it makes a difference, would significantly be more cost effective. So is it? So physical activity and hip fractures, here you can see again, looking at our met hours per week, if we actually increase our activities for total after, uh, over, over a week, we have a significant relative risk that drops in terms of your hip fractures if you're active over the week. Uh, this was done in a large study, 61,000 postmenopausal women controlled for all different other factors. So it's really pretty good evidence to support the fact that exercise reduces the risk of hip fractures by about 55%. So building bone can prevent falls. Uh, here's a variety of different studies that support that. And so basically, it's very high quality evidence that supports that uh, a combination of resistant strength and aerobic training to build bone and resist bone loss can reduce the risk of stress fractures and fractures in our elderly. Another factor that's probably key in, in terms of other than just the aerob aerobic training as well as strength training is balance training. And so uh, some type of uh, uh, Tai Chi exercises, other sources of uh, balance training also have been shown to have significant effect. So if you, can, if you can avoid the fall, then you can reduce the risk of fractures also. So another example, osteo osteoarthritis. 52-year-old male with right knee pain, decreased activities on daily living. Is exercise is medicine a reasonable choice for this person and, and exercise? Well, in fact, there's numerous studies, uh, uh, a Cochrane review by Franson, a variety of other randomized control trials, meta-analysis of randomized control trials that would suggest that there's a high quality evidence that exercise does have a significant effect, particularly in reducing pain. It's actually been shown to be as effective as non-steroidal use, as well as injections uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, functional uh, approaches for people with arthritis that are not yet ready for total knee arthroplasties. Uh, it improves function, it improves quality of life, and improves strength and balance. Now, I think one of the things we'll see uh, uh, kind of consistently over all of these different aspects of exercise as medicine is it improves not only pain or function or these direct targets of these diagnoses, but also improves quality of life. So it actually has a, a, a mental uh, a positive a, 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 a approach to their affect that has an impact on their life. So it can impact all, 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 all joints, and aqua therapy, water therapy works particularly well because it actually deloads the joint while working on fitness. How about rheumatoid arthritis? 55-year-old woman with multiple joint rheumatoid arthritis with stiffness in the morning, dysfunction, and chronic fatigue. Is this a candidate for, for exercise as medicine? Well, I have not seen. Let's see what the, 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 the literature would support. Cochrane Review, 2013, non-pharmacologic uh, non inter interventions uh, for fatigue and RA, it uh, does support the use of exercise for non-pharmacologic uses for, uh, for our RA, it improves, uh, improves fatigue, 9% reduction in fatigue, as well as improves psychosocial changes. Uh, exercise cycling, strength, training, and weight bearing, a randomized control trial by DeLong also supports uh, a strong use for rheumatoid arthritis. It has a positive impact on bone as well as function for those. How about, how about this 34-year-old woman with chronic uh, diffuse myofascial pain, chronic non-steroidal use, occasional narcotic use, aches and pains everywhere. So does it work in chronic pain as well as for fibromyalgia? Variety of studies that su would support uh, that for these diagnoses, it, resistance tr training improves fibromyalgia, aerobic training improves fibromyalgia, aquatic training improves fibromyalgia pain, and body vibration techniques improve fibromyalgia pain. So uh, the quality of evidence, kind of mid-level, but certainly supports its use uh, uh, in those groups. So it, uh, it improves wellness, physical function, decreases pain, and again, improves quality of life. So it improves their psychological uh, 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 status um, uh, when they're doing routine exercises. So how about chronic fatigue and migraines? So actually, this is more of an example of my, my daughter who actually has uh, chronic migraines and can exercise pot potentially work. So a 25-year-old woman with chronic fatigue and recurrent migraines, 
does it have a, a potential effect? The answer is eight high quality uh, uh, RCTs, improved sleep, which is going to make you happier, make you more functional, less fatigue, improved physical function, and improved self-perceived health. Uh, uh, another study compared relaxation, exercise, and uh, classic medicine uh, like Topamax, and all three reduced the incidence of attacks with none being particularly better, which means exercise is as good as medicine or other relaxation techniques. Pretty high quality evidence, and in fact, I mentioned my daughter. Yes, we've strongly recommended that she, she's got in a routine exercise program, and that, that N of 1, that high quality evidence of N of 1, it's worked for her. So she's actually uh, better because of those things. Now, remember I told you that uh, some of this that I'm walking you through comes from the American College of Sports Medicine, so after each of the sections, I'm going to actually update you for the most recent uh, meeting at the American College of Sports Medicine. Uh, there were uh, uh, 10 posters or presentations t uh, specifically targeting pain uh, with exercise and medicine, and this, the quality of evidence there was basically mixed and basically suggested that it can serve as a distractor to improve pain, i.e., you may still have pain, but you're just doing more exercises, so you're feeling better about uh, what you're doing and your approach to life, but must carefully assess specific exercise as to much can exacerbate the perception of pain if you do too much. So now let's talk about uh, 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 neurologic diseases as well as psychologic diseases. Your brain loves the gym. Your, lo your brain loves to work out. It has a variety of different factors that, uh, that are going to walk through the, uh, sp some specific diagnoses, but what's really going on? It actually in increases norepinephrine. It increases BDNF, which is a brain-derived neurotrophic uh, growth fat factor, which actually, actually can improve the number of fibrils and, and uh, 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 neurons in your brain. Uh, the hormones contained within BDNF grow brain cells, regulate mood, provide mental clarity. It actually can increase the size of your hippocampus. Um, it increases the endorphins. We all know when you run, you feel better when, you're, when you have the endorphins. Increases serotonin, uh, which enhances your mood. Increases blood flow to the brain and increases dopamine. So all of these different factors are occurring with exercise, which probably then have uh, 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 positive effects on impact. So we're going to walk through in terms of neurologic diseases and psychologic diseases. We'll talk about some key issues with these neurologic diseases, including dementia, Parkinson's, uh, a little bit on muscle, multiple sclerosis, and maybe some, some on seizures. So how about a 58-year-old attorney with a family history of Alzheimer's? Increased forgetfulness. He's hunting for words. Can exercise help that person? I mean, is that, is that something we should do, or is, it, uh, is Alzheimer's inevitable? Uh, uh, what, 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 what can go on? Well, in Alzheimer's, 3% uh, uh, of the population uh, uh, over age 65, but if you actually, it's up to 47% over age 40 have some sort of dementia. Over 200 different diseases contribute to dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's is the most common, making up about 50%, and there can be vascular issues that are associated with that. There's mixed high-quality evidence that would support that exercise can make a difference. And how about our cost comparison that we had before? Cost comparison of treatment uh, for uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease, $239 a month for Aricept, $191 per month for Namenda, uh, $250 a month uh, for Exelon. And interestingly, there's no significant evidence that these drugs actually prevent dementia, but they may delay their progression for about 6 to 12 months. So the question is, if exercise can actually have the same effect, it would be more cost effective, but it might actually have a better effect. And home exercise is cheap. So. Does it have an effect, exercise, in terms of reducing your dementia risk? Well, if you actually exercise more than three times a week, this was a study of 1,740 uh, men and women over age 65, in fact, just looking at their exercise habits, and you can see the significant decrease or the, 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 the improved risk, risk by doing exercise more than three times a week. Relative risk of dementia progression over time, 40% decreased risk. Um, we know that uh, it, it, a variety of now other quality studies, remember the green is really good, so these are meta-analysis, RCTs, so the green is good. Uh, it reduces vascular dimension risk, 28% decreased risk with high-intensity training, and there's persistent vigorous exercise is protective. Absolutely pretty, pretty shown that continued exercise is going to help your brain over the long term and prevent potentially the risk of developing dementia. Just another pattern in terms of how, the, how this goes on. It decreases cortisol, decreases some of these other risk factors uh, in terms of de decreases your risk of diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, 
obesity, hypertension. It decreases those things. It then turns around and gives you a positive overall fitness that decreases your risk of getting Alzheimer's. But it improves your, uh, your CSF blood flow and your CSF flow. By doing that, it decreases your beta amyloid. Beta amyloid is the, the, the junk that gets left behind with chronic changes that probably is associated with, uh, with dementia. Uh, uh, so very, very positive effect with exercise. How about in terms of treating dementia? Now, unfortunately, you have dementia. Can exercise particularly help that? Now, there's less quality evidence in terms of actually improve your, improve your cognition, but ultimately it does show that exercise in, for, for somebody who has dementia improves cognition, improves, improves activities of daily living, and improves their strength. So mixed, mixed results if you actually have dementia, but probably has a positive effect. And more specifically, here's some other factors. It does increase your hippocampal size. <coughs> it increases BDNF, which we've already said is going to improve the uh, 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 good hormones in your brain, which probably has a positive effect. <coughs> And it improves your spatial awareness, which then decreases your ability, your, your risk of fall. And probably another interesting fact for dementia and probably a lot of our psychologic diseases is actually by doing exercise, it reduces caregiver burden. So you have family members and things like that that have to help with the, the dementia. The exercise actually uh, in, improves their, uh, their risk and load. Um, so uh, here's the Alzheimer's Association of, of International Conference in 2015. Again, positive effects, reduced anxiety, changes in mood, improves uh, uh, issues of depression, uh, improves mental speed, memory language, pretty much all kinds of different things, positive effect. So what would you want to prescribe? Uh, you want to choose enjoyable activities to improve compliance. Group exercises for dementia patients seem to have a good social motivation. Uh, you want to uh, have daily routine or at least more than three times a week. Uh, have, have high intensity exercises that improves heart rate, which is going to improve the brain blood flow. So how about Parkinson's? Uh, second most common neurodegenerative disorder. 1% of people over age 60 up to 4% over 80. Mean onset over 60, they get tremors, rigidity, slow movement, shuffling gait. Can exercise and medicine have an effect with them? Well, this is actually a Parkinson's study, and you can see in the center picture, this is what the brain looks like with some of the Parkinson's uh, problems. Uh, with these the basically low activities uh, uh, around the brain. Now you can see if they're on medicine, you see how you have increased activities here, but it's actually even probably even better or as good as medicine by, by this MRI study uh, in terms of the increased activity post-exercise. So with Parkinson's, mixed to, uh, mixed to high quality evidence that would support that walking speed, uh, uh, it improves walking speed, activities of daily living, six-minute walking test by doing treadmill training. Another interesting study for Parkinson's is there's uh, some study that, that called the Rock Steady. It's basically boxing programs. And what they're doing is they have to work with footwork and they actually work with targeting things in space. And by doing both of those activities, it improves their gait velocity, balance, endurance, mobility, and quality of life uh, for people with Parkinson's. Now, what for me, as I walk through some of this stuff with exercise as medicine, another, th another message that this one sends me is that with some neurologic diseases, we have to choose the type of exercise program that we're going to get. So targeted exercise programs are going to make a difference compared to say, okay, just put this guy in a treadmill, maybe not as effective as targeting him with some type of a balanced, targeted structural program, which is actually going to improve them. So Parkinson's one hour per day of exercises, uh, individually tailored, supervised is better, and you want to start slowly and gradually progress. So how about, how about MS, multiple sclerosis? 45-year-old woman with intermittent severe fatigue, numbness worse, uh, uh, numbness worse uh, uh, in the morning. Can MS, uh, uh, can exercise as medicine help, help with this? The answer is absolutely. So uh, exercise increases strength, mobility, aerobic capacity, uh, uh, energy, and, as well as quality of life. In terms of MS, uh, uh, individually tailored based on st the stage of disease, you want to do combined muscle, muscle strength as well as fitness programs, as well as energy-based fitness training uh, for all ac activities. So how about we step on now to some of the psychologic types of problems that, that we're going to face uh, or potentially face with uh, EIM. Depression, stress, anxiety, addiction, psychosis, schizophrenia, are there potential benefits of exercise medicine with these? So an example, 27-year-old woman, mother of two, chronically sad, overwhelmed with reduced feelings of self-worth, 
She's been prescribed the antidepressant by her MD. It's exercise as medicine, something that's reasonable for her. Back to our cost comparisons. Uh, you can get about a 30% achievement of remission on depression medications. The cost of the medications, you can see, again, fairly expensive. And the question is, is, can we reduce the cost or optimize outcome adding exercise into this program? So depression, risk, and fitness. So if we act, now can we just reduce the risk of depression, not just treat it? And uh, what you can see over time is that clinical depression in women who, uh, uh, by amount of daily exercise, if you actually have more than 90 minutes of exercise per day compared to less than 10 minutes, you can see the significant decrease in overall uh, 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 depression risk over time. Now, how about if you have depression? Can you actually go into remission and maintain remission with depression? Here's our control group. Here's if you're actually exercising more than 180 minutes per week, so 30 minutes a day. Uh, uh, in fact, you can see significant remission rates, so 40% go into remission with exercising more than 180 minutes compared to uh, uh, not no exercise at all. So 40% better remission rate with strong exercise. So long-term benefits of exercise therapy. You can see compared to medications, long-term benefits are improved uh, uh, with exercise as medicine. And this is, interesting, this is an interesting kind of a spot chart that basically looks through all the different types of therapy that you can use for depression. You have art therapy, you have medications, you have supplement medicines. And if you actually look at this and you say, what is the effectiveness versus popularity? The most powerful thing, both by effectiveness and, and, and popular, popularity, is exercise. So it has a very powerful effect with depression. So kind of uh, associated with depression is stress and anxiety. Here's a 23-year-old college student with stress and anxiety, unhappy with her weight. Weight gain on anxiolytic medicines. Can exercise actually play a role for her? Current 5% of adults uh, globally with pathologic anxiety. 15% will have a, 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 a stress anxiety event, more common in women. And then what do we know in terms of exercise as medicine? Again, high quality evidence. There's if with reducing stresses versus exercise, exercise helps reduce stresses, particularly stronger for depression. We said the evidence was strong for depression, but certainly a positive effect also with anxiety. So here you can see uh, uh, in terms of stress and anxiety, uh, fitness is related directly to anxiety, reduced anxiety with exercise, improves fitness, improves aerobic uh, uh, treatment, as well as Qui Gong, all actually have a positive effect, all of these different uh, types of treatments. In terms of how, how much you should do uh, for to, uh, to target stress and anxiety, about one hour per day, uh, uh, 30 to 60 minutes per day. And the goal is, on this Borg scale, to be somewhere between 15 to 16, which means you're actually putting in a pretty strong effort of exercise uh, to get to that level. So how about uh, some true psychologic issues like uh, schizophrenia, uh, which is integration dysregulation syndrome. I, I think I probably still call it schizophrenia, but that's, that's the, the accepted name now. 38-year-old man with a history of schizophrenia, unemployed, but living on his own, recent decline in function. Uh, fairly common, 24 million, peel, uh, million people, low em employability, 25% can recover completely, 50% uh, recover socially, and 25% become dependent. So how about exercise for these? A variety of different studies. Pretty high quality evidence that would support the use of exercise in people with schizophrenia. So a positive effect of outcome versus exercise. It improves daily function, improves cognition, improves, it reduces stress, improves concentration, improves sociability, well-being, and once again grows the hippocampus. Interestingly, with schizophrenia, which is uh, this pathologic problem that they actually they have hallucinations, they actually have reduced auditory hallucinations also. So exercise can have a big role. In terms of if you had a patient with this type of a psychologic issue, then training is best done in small groups. Uh, uh, so uh, again, socialization seems to be a very positive effect with this group. They get positive feedback, and it improves their continued uh, compliance and motivation. At the American College of Sports Medicine, there were 51 posters or present, uh, presentations focused on brain issues and exercises medicine, uh, and a uh, general consensus with uh, uh, moderate, moderate uh, uh, level of evidence. Exercise improves cerebral blood flow, improves cognition, reduces disability, uh, slows progression of neurologic disease, and improves psychological state of mind. Now, the improved psychological state of mind is going to, again, we've talked about with the, the 
pain issues. We've talked about with the arthritis issues. Now with psychologic issues, as well as depression issues and, and, and neurologic issues, this psychologic state of mind is going to have this overarching effect that exercise is positive. And now the, our next, uh, next issue is this is also what we're going to see in terms of using exercise as medicine with cancer. And so uh, uh, is cancer the bane of our existence? Uh, well, probably. And there's some different things that exercise may help us either reduce the ri risk of cancer or potentially uh, reduce the, pro uh, the progression of cancer. That's our two targets. So how about a 34-year-old woman discovered an irregular mass in her breast can ex exercise uh, reduce her risk and then can exercise optimize her recovery? Well, we know that uh, being overweight has been directly associated with 13 types of different cancers. So we're talking about using exercise to fight obesity to try to reduce those potential risks and, and uh, because there is a direct correlation between those. So again, is obesity it or is it exercise? We'll figure this out. Uh, uh, there's emerging evidence in the field of exercise oncology. Uh, uh, this was, uh, uh, you can see the growth that's occurred from 2007, the total number of articles available, and just over the last 10 years, increased number of articles focusing on exercise as medicine in oncology and its potential impact. And this is just the number of randomized control trials, so now we're actually talking even better quality studies. Originally, some were about 76 up to 308 over the last 10 years. So what are some of the potential mechanisms of how this is going to actually work in some of the cancer patients? So increased physical activity actually is going to have all of these potential effects. And our goal here is to decrease cancer risk and improve survival. And it's going to do it by decreasing inflammation, improving uh, hormones, uh, decreasing angiogenesis, decreasing insulin and glucose, increase, uh, decreasing oxidative stress, and changing some of the chemical, uh, uh, chemical functions around the body. All of these things will actually potentially have an effect. So what do we really know in terms of reducing cancer risk? Well, there's really pretty strong evidence that actually in uh, several different types of cancer that physically active lifestyle reduces their cancer risk. Colon, breast, endometrial cancer, prostate, and stomach all are true. If you are generally physically fit and doing exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you're going to have a less risk of getting cancer. This is a very large study. Uh, we, I, these are borrowed, borrowed slides from Dr. Steve Moore, which is associated, associated with leisure time activities on 1.44 million adults, 26 different types of cancer. The study groups were eight U.S. Co cohorts and four European co co cohorts. Again, 1.44 million, 55% were women. They had 187,000 cancers. Now the question is, is if we can break these people out and say, are you exercise active or are you not, and then correlate this with cancer and see if, see if exercise has a role. And this is the, uh, the NCI results for non-adjusted non for BMI. So what you can see is when, it, when, the, when you're in the green, and so the dots are falling to the left, you've actually reduced your risk of cancer. And so exercise active people, all of these different cancers have reduced risk. Pretty impressive. But I, the first slide I, t I showed you on cancer said there were 13 different things that were directly had obesity as re related to cancer. So now the question is, is it exercise or is it obesity? Which is the two that particularly is the thing that, that's causing the potential risk of cancer? Well, we might be able to figure this out, and that is here's the associations in the same study after adjusting the BMI. So taking BMI out, averaging that out, what you can still see is that uh, uh, most of them still fall into the, this green area that's to the left, of the, the left of the line that says exercise by itself, regardless of obesity, exercise reduces your risk of cancer. The only one that fell out from that, so that you can see this one here, says so it doesn't really kind of fall in, got a little bit worse, uh, just kind of fell back to neutral, was endometrial cancer. So there, there's a variety of powerful uh, 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 factors that would suggest that doing exercise is going to reduce your risk of cancer. How about improved survivorship? Uh, well, here are some studies that suggest that once you've had cancer and you add exercise to your treatment program beyond the normal treatments, is actually exercise fitness improves the survivorship, particularly in breast and colon cancer, but also in prostate cancer. And then maybe if you had a pre-diagnosis physical activity level, so you're already healthy, then you come up with a diagnosis. In lung and kidney, it also shows your survivorship is improved. So 
uh, then we, we've talked about uh, before in terms of the psychological effect of exercise that probably improves your quality of life, reduces your depression, reduces your anxiety, makes you feel better all around. Well, this is going to have the positive effect uh, that's going to kind of bleed over. If you have cancer and you're doing exercise, it's going to help all of those different things. It's going to help you sleep. It's going to help better fitness. You're going to have better perceived energy. You're going to have less psychological burden, and it's going to overall improve your quality of life. And this has been shown. Uh, uh, particularly in breast cancer research, lower quality evidence in children, uh, and uh, uh, so overall uh, uh, positive effect. And this, was, this, was, this, these are studies that actually are looking at yoga or tai chi uh, as a specific type of exercise program. So how about ACSM uh, as we kind of uh, start winding down? 49 posters or presentations uh, that were targeting cancer. Uh, uh, the, the newest president of the American College of Sports Medicine is Katie Smith. Schmitz, her actually premium focus is uh, uh, exercise to reduce the risk of cancer and improve cancer over time. Uh, and what we see from the, mo the group studies of uh, ACSM, exercise influences tumor biology, improve, improves therapy and efficacy and tolerance, and enhances outcome and survivorship for patients with cancer. Here, as you can see, uh, one of the key issues that if you're going to write a prescription for somebody with cancer, you actually have to look at a few different things. If they have lymphedema, uh, uh, if they have stem cell transplants, osteotomies, peripheral neuropathy, uh, uh, bone loss problems, uh, basically the bottom is, is if you're going to write a prescription for somebody of exercise that has a history of cancer, you're going to want to tailor their exercise program. Uh, the goal is going to be a combined moderate intensity program that mixes aerobic and resistance training. But if they had a bone met or bone issues, you may want to do less resistance training. You want to make sure that bone part is healed. You want to avoid exercise during active chemo or radiation, particularly if they're at risk of uh, uh, infection with severe anemia, uh, increased temperatures. Uh, if they have an active infection, you want to avoid it at that time. Uh, and you want to avoid immediately after surgery. But after that, you want to gradually improve their activities. Uh, uh, yoga type programs seem to have a very positive effect. In terms of the cancer issues, uh, this is a nice reference uh, that basically is shown over the last 10 years, 12,000 pages of systemic, systematic literature reviews focused on the, the benefits of cancer. So as we come to a conclusion, EIM versus pain, brain, and bane, bane of our existence, cancer, it's time to get fit. Frequency of physical activity, intensity of physical activity, time spent in physical activity, and the type of physical activity are all going to be important particularly in each of those specific diagnoses, you're going to figure out which mix of exercise activity is going to be helpful for your patient. Uh, uh, clear, clearly you can see those different types of activities. Lifting, lifting weights in, increases activities in the prefrontal cortex, improves complex thinking. Yoga, again, frontal lobe, insula, uh, integrates thoughts and emo emotions. So all of these different, fa different things may, may have a different benefit on part, part, parts of di different parts of the brain or different parts of effectiveness for the patient, aerobic exercise, sports drills. So thank you for your attention.